Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about ODFS um, radars and uh, something which connects the two concepts, which is the SAC transform. And I'm actually very happy that there are some people uh, participating in this workshop, like Robert Heath. And I don't know if Kair is still here, um, because they also co authored some papers on ODFS. And I'm kind of curious to hear their opinion or about my work. And um, so to get started, um, I was in a project with uh, NXP looking into FMCW radars and communication. But at one point, I also came across this ODFS rate, uh, waveform. And, um, and in this talk, yeah, I, as I mentioned before, I'm going also to talk about radar. And there's, um, I would say there's an intersecting part, which is the SAC transform, which can be used to describe both. So you can see that ODFS and radar, uh, like a communication waveform and the radar waveform do not have to be something different. And I'm not going to talk about very much in detail about ODFS. Um, I will mo most, mostly focus on different aspects or like um, uh, how this connects. And I will jump between those um, three concepts uh, uh, in, during this talk. And in the end, I, I will boil them down and you can see that this nicely connects using this SAC transform. So, um, yeah, so ODFS um, was like introduced like so already my, something like five years ago, um, uh, and the fundamental concept of ODFS is that it places symbols, uh, information bearing symbols in the delay Doppler domain. Like OFDM places symbols in the time frequency domain, uh, ODFS places them in the delay Doppler domain. And when is this useful? Uh, this is useful when you talk about uh, channels with high mobilities, like you have certain reflectors or the receiver and transmitters are moving. And um, so that the, the received signal in such scenarios is a superposition of delayed and Doppler shifted uh, replicas of your transmitted signal. And the big advantage of ODFS uh, is that it turns a time variant channel, which would be experienced uh, in OFDM into a time invariant channel. So this means that all symbols placed in the delay Doppler domain uh, experience the same channel. So for example, in this case here, we have some symbols placed in the delay Doppler domain. Um, the channel interaction is then a two-dimensional convolution and the receiver will see uh, this in the symbol interference in the, uh, in the delay Doppler domain. So unlike what is here presented in this, um, uh, delay Doppler domain here, that there are only a few uh, symbols defined. Usually you define the end diagrid and you will see that there is a lot of inter simple interaction, uh, interference in the delay Doppler domain at the receiver. And usually you do some message passing algorithms to do the simple detection. But this is not the point of my talk today. I will talk about more on the signal perspective uh, of ODFS. Um, so how is ODFS typically described? So in ODFS, typically you define the symbols in the delay Doppler domain. Then you apply a so-called inverse symplectic finite Fourier transform. This uh, is a two-dimensional Fourier transform which maps the symbols defined in the delay Doppler domain uh, to the time frequency domain. Um, the symbols in the time frequency domain are then mapped to the time domain using this Heisenberg transform. The Heisenberg transform in this case is simply ODF uh, of the M modulation. And after that, the uh, symbols, uh, the, the signal is sent over, sent over an um, time frequency dispersive channel, which introduces delay and Doppler shifts. And at the receiver, you uh, do the inverse operation from the Heisenberg transform, like O of the M demodulation. Uh, and then you map the symbols in the delay Doppler domain uh, back to the time, uh, from the time frequency domain back to the delay Doppler domain. And let's look into details. What is this uh, symplectic finite Fourier transform and the Heisenberg transform look like? Um, the inverse symplectic finite Fourier transform is basically a two-dimensional Fourier transform. Um, the, the term symplectic stems from the fact that we have two different signs here in the Fourier transform. One is a inverse Fourier transform while the other one is a Fourier transform. And what is it doing is that when we define symbols in the delay Doppler domain, so this is a grid in the delay Doppler domain, 
we have L samples in the delay domain, we have K samples in the Doppler domain, is that it maps these symbols to some symbols in the time frequency domain. And I can see that's a two dimensional uh, waveform, uh, Fourier transform. So if you define one symbol here, it gives you a wave in, in this domain where you can have certain orientations of this wave and frequencies. And um, uh, what is also happening is that it changes the dimensionality. What was first um, the delay domain? So here we have L samples in the, in the delay domain. Uh, we get then L subcarriers. And what was here, the, the K samples in the Doppler domain, they will get uh, become M symbols in the uh, time domain. And in the end, what we're doing is we map the symbols using standard uh, OFDM uh, uh, transmitter processing onto a time domain signal. So we have here, when we look at the inner sum, we have here the subcarriers, like with subspace sub case spacing uh, delta F, and uh, which is typically, typically chosen to be the inverse of the pulse uh, length, capital D. And that's everything at the moment, what I'm going to talk about OFDS. I will come later back to this ODFS, but let's continue and let's talk about some radars. So there are many different types of radars, like you have these continuous wave radars. And another type of radar is this pulse radar. When you look, for example, in this radar handbook by Skolnik, you can see that the pulse radar is defined by this radar, which sends repetitively uh, rectangular pulses. And how does this look like? Um, suppose we have here a radar, a stationary radar, we have a moving target at a certain distance r and with a certain velocity v. The, as I said before, uh, the radar transmits a pulse strain of k pulses, where each pulse has a length of uh, capital D. And between two pulses, we have this pulse repetition interval. How does the received signal then look like? Um, we have some attenuation, then we have a delay, uh, and we have some Doppler shift, which are indicated here by this dashed line. So typically what you assume in radar is that um, the pulse, uh, the, the distance between the pulse repetition interval is so short that the target movement between two consecutive pulses can be neglected. If this would be chosen too long, you have phenomena like range migration. And a second very important assumption is that um, the, the pulse itself is so narrow that you can neglect uh, the Doppler shift of this pulse. And uh, what we can see, or we assume further, that uh, there's only a constant phase. Uh, the Doppler shift uh, influences only the phase of this pulse. Uh, but this phase changes between two consecutive pulses. Uh, at the receiver, we do not process um, the, the, the analog waveform. Instead, we sample the received signal. So here in this case, we collect L samples between two consecutive pulses. And the, uh, the processing is done, done in the uh, discrete domain. And how does this look like, the, this processing? Um, what you do is you arrange your samples in a two-dimensional grid. So what you do is like you take you take the first sample and then the next L uh, uh, sample spaced by L and so on and arrange them in a column here. Then you go on, you take the second sample and arrange them here in the second column and so on. Um, for example, in this case now here, here was the target present. So we can see here um, the pulse being present at a certain range bin. And each of those samples will have a certain uh, phase rotation. And the Doppler processing is then done um, by taking the discrete Fourier transform along the columns of this uh, uh, range Doppler matrix. And this, since there is a modulated signal now, the Fourier transform will compress uh, the spread signal into a one impulse. And what we can see then here, we have the range Doppler map and we can identify the range and the Doppler shift of this signal, which gives us the range and uh, velocity information of the target. Uh, 
Um, so now let's go already to the SAC transform. So the SAC transform is a, a signal uh, transform. Uh, it has been, yeah, the origin is from uh, in, in quantum physics, but there has been also studies. Uh, it's quite useful also in signal processing. It's been, it has been used in Will Heisenberg frames and other applications. And um, when you look at the SAC transform, it's just defined as the, um, the discrete Fourier transform of a subsampled sequence. So here we can, uh, the, the summation is over L. So we can see here a subsampled sequence uh, here. And what is also happening is that we have uh, the subsampled sequence, uh, we start at a different starting index. And when we look how this is computed, um, it's nothing else than when we arrange our samples in a two dimensional, or like in a, this matrix. So we take the first L samples in the first row, the second L samples in the second row, and so on. And we can calculate the SAC transform by taking the Fourier transform along the columns. And this is exactly what we were doing before when we talked about uh, the pulse radar, the receiver. We exactly did the same. We took the, we arranged the samples in this matrix and we took the uh, Fourier transform along the columns of this matrix. So we can say from that perspective, uh, the, the radar receiver applies the SAC transform. So the SAC transform has some interesting properties. Since we're talking here about discrete signals, and we're talking about um, or finite discrete, finite length uh, discrete signal, uh, sequences. We can, uh, like what we do in uh, uh, standard DFD processing, we can also consider them to be periodic with period n. So we, when you take now, they've uh, considered this sequence to be periodic with period n. Um, we can also introduce some properties uh, in the SAC domain. So first of all, the SAC transform is quasi-periodic in time. What does this mean is that when we look at a shifted uh, uh, version of the SAC transform, like we look at the certain different index where the index is spaced by capital L, we see that this SAC transform is equivalent to the SAC transform at the distance uh, at, uh, at N but we will get an additional complex factor here. And uh, moreover, the, it's periodic in frequency. Those two, two properties are quite intuitive. When you think, for example, here, uh, since it is the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform and the discrete Fourier transform is itself periodic in the frequency domain, uh, this will give you this property. And here we look at shifted version of the subsampled sequence and a shift in the time corresponds to a com uh, linear phase in the uh, frequency domain, which gives you this property. This can also be nicely visualized when you talk about here, this, uh, oh no, sorry, um, properties. So we're talking about periodic sequences and here we talk about this, um, uh, yeah, here we talk about this fundamental rectangle. As I said before, uh, it extends quasi periodically in time. So here we, in the x axis, we have the index n, and in the y axis, we have the index k. And uh, what I missed before, because there was a jump in the slides, I'm sorry for that. Um, we always have the constraint that uh, k and l, which we choose here, the parameters, they have to be equal to the length of the sequence or the period of the sequence because this guarantees that we always can arrange uh, the sequence in such a matrix. And uh, what the point is here, that is we can fully describe a periodic sequence by only looking at this fundamental rectangle here. We do not need the values here because they are just a replica of this values here, which is also quite logic because we have a sequence which is of length n and here we have n samples. So we just need to know these n samples and we can fully describe this uh, sequence. And there's also, of course, the inverse relation. So we can calculate from the, uh, from the SAC representation of a signal, also the signal itself. And this is done via this sum relation. So what we need to do is we only need to sum uh, along the k index. 
of this uh, uh, SAC representation. And if we use this quasi periodicity property, we simply can express uh, the, sequen uh, the sequence like this in this form here, because we use the quasi periodicity, we simply can write it as this. And this can be actually computed quite easy. So it might look a bit complicated here, but um, it's quite intuitive and to look at this. So we saw that the SAC transform was taking the, the Fourier transform of a subsample sequence. So we can say now the inverse SAC transform is reversing this operation. So first of all, we take the inverse Fourier transform uh, of uh, the columns of this matrix and we get a sequence. And then what we're doing is we upsample this sequence. So we get a space, like we get a train of uh, impulses because for example, in this example, here I define the index K equals zero, which gives me a DC component. And then we spread the symbols here. And here the, the, the gray dots are zero values. Uh, so they don't give us any value. For example, here we get a zero sequence and they again, again are spread over here. And since this is the starting index N, we start here at uh, like starting index one. And we start here spreading them with index one and so on. And then we get here, uh, the, our full sequence is then this. This is just a train of uh, uh, these pulses, which are each of them is spaced by capital L. So we can also, also uh, define different uh, points here in the SAC domain. Uh, for example, if we define here now a point, uh, which is at the K equals uh, unequals to zero, this will give us then a modulated signal. So for example, here, the blue indicates the real part of the sequence and the red indicates the, the imaginary part. And this sequence is then also again spread. We see here the in starting index is uh, two because zero, one, two, we start here two and we start spreading the sequence. And uh, the interesting bit here is that all of those points are actually all, or all of those sequences which uh, can be recovered from single points here are orthonormal sequence. So we have actually that the SAC transform is an orthonormal basis. And now how does this, uh, two more properties I would like to talk here, um, uh, which is also when you talk about OFDM, you have circular convolutions and uh, which turns into uh, multiplication in the frequency domain. But in, in the SAC domain, uh, when we have a circular convolution of two periodic sequences, um, they turn into a convolution in the SAC domain of the two sequences uh, with respect to the variable n. So we convolve along the time index. If we have a modulation, it means the, the element wise product between two sequences. Uh, what we get is that we get a convolution with respect to the frequency variable in the SAC domain. So we take the, we can calculate the, the SAC domain representation of the mod, uh, modulated signal by just convolving the uh, SAC domain representation from the individual signals with respect to K and L. And how does this relate to radar? So, so far we have seen that we can describe uh, the radar receiver uh, with the discrete SAC transform, but the question is now, can we do also describe the transmitter with the SAC transform? And the answer to this is yes. Um, as I showed you before, a single non-zero element in this uh, fundamental rectangle, uh, when it's located at location N0 and K0, which is indicated here, will translate to a ball strain like this, with, with, which is spaced. And when we map this sequence, uh, onto uh, uh, analog waveform using pulse amplitude modulation, uh, we can see uh, that we exactly get our radar waveform, which I was presenting before, where here LD is equal to the pulse repetition interval. And uh, now, before turning uh, the attention to ODFS, uh, I would like to address some point uh, regarding OFDM because so far, or in most of the, in the majority of the papers on, on OFDM, you use uh, in of on the papers on ODFS, you use OFDM in the end. So you do this 
symplectic Fourier transforms to get the time frequency domain representation of the signal, and then do you do an OFDM transform? But uh, the model, the OFDM uh, transmission usually you represent by this analog mm, mm, uh, modulation here. You have your symbols defined in the frequency domain, which you map onto a modulated pulse, where the pulse length is this capital D, which relates to the subcarrier spacing. But in reality, that's not how OFDM is done. So the great success of OFDM actually came or is due to its uh, digital implementation and fast Fourier algorithms. And what you're doing is that you have actually we replaced this pulse G of D by shorter pulses. And uh, what you can get, uh, what you or how the implementation looks like is, is this way. So you have the symbols in the frequency domain, you perform an inverse discrete Fourier transform, you get your sequence. And to sustain the cyclic properties, uh, you add a cyclic prefix by copy pasting the last L symbols or like the length of the cyclic prefix. And then you send this and do pulse amplitude modulation, which can like this can model, for example, the low bus filter. And when we talk now about ODFS, we can also talk about the digital implementation of ODFS. And when we talk about this, uh, the, we can talk about, or I showed you already that we can represent um, the symbols in a matrix form. So we have our symbols in the delay Doppler domain, which are matrix of size K times L. And also when we do the delay, uh, the symplectic finite Fourier transform, we can get a matrix, which represents uh, the symbols in the time frequency domain. And with a slight abuse of notation here, I'm using also uh, this uh, small x to represent this matrix uh, of the sam of the time domain signal. So where we have in the rows, the, the L samples, like the first L samples are uh, in the first row and so on. When we use this notation, we can see that the inverse symplectic finite Fourier transform is nothing else than applying a inverse uh, Fourier transform to the left of this matrix X in the delay Doppler domain and a uh, Fourier transform to the right of the matrix X. And the ODFS, ODFS modulation or the OFDM modulation here in this case would then be applying, sorry, um, applying um, the inverse Fourier transform to the right of this matrix. But this just, uh, then we have, if we use this not, uh, relation here, we get here a unit matrix and it ends up to be like this. And this is actually nothing else what I presented you before, taking the Fourier transform along the columns um, or the inverse Fourier transform along the columns and uh, we get then our matrix here. So from that perspective, we can see that the inverse symplectic finite Fourier transform plus the OFDM modulation uh, resembles the inverse discrete SAC transform. And when we talk, then we can also model our ODFS modulation in that way by saying, okay, uh, instead of doing this way of um, trans modulating or transforming all the symbols from the delay Doppler domain to the time frequency domain, we can directly apply the inverse uh, discrete SAC transform on our matrix X in the delay Doppler domain. We get a sequence in the time uh, in the time domain, and similar to uh, OFDM, we want to have cyclic properties, so we add a cyclic uh, prefix, and then we do the parallel to serial conversion, and we transmit the do pulse amplitude modulation, and we transmit the signal. So, I told you before that uh, in ODFS or like in we are dealing with channels which introduce delay and uh, modulation or like. Doppler shifts. So how does this look, this channel effects actually look like in the SAC domain or in the delay Doppler domain then? Uh, and therefore we just, that's, that's actually something you can work out nicely graphically. Um, so for example, we have here the matrix X, uh, which represents the symbols in the delay Doppler domain. Um, when we apply the inverse discrete SAC transform, we get this, uh, the, the samples in the time domain, which are arranged like described before. And this matrix is now here to the left. And we suppose we make a cyclic shift of this sequence by one. What is happening is uh, that the, the first symbol gets, the first sample gets to the second position, which you can see here. 
um, the last sample gets falls out of this row and comes in in the next row. So it, uh, X5, which was here, goes now here, and so on. And the last sample here, the X29, which was here, due to the cyclic extension, comes in at the first position. So when we do now the SAC transform on this uh, signal is, again, taking the Fourier transform along the columns of this matrix. So what we can see is actually all the symbols which were previously defined in the first row are now in the second row and so on. But uh, since we have here in the last, the first row is the previous last row, and this is nothing else than a cyclic shifted sequence itself. And since we're taking the Fourier transform here, uh, we can see that we get uh, due to the cyclic shift property of the Fourier transform is that we can see here, we get an additional linear factor this uh, here, um, which I indicated here by these colors. So model uh, delay just shifts, cyclic shifts uh, in the delay Doppler domain plus uh, those which falls out in the back come in at the beginning and uh, they will get an additional phase. And for modulation, uh, I didn't work out the graphical uh, uh, way, but you can also do it in a math way, very simple. So uh, by using this modulation property, for example, when you have a delay uh, modulation, a Doppler shift, we can model this by this complex exponential here. And let's call this uh, U of n. By looking at this U of n, uh, the sucked of transform of this U of n, we can see that this is nothing else a delta function with some additional complex factor. And when we use the modulation transform pair, that was that um, the sucked transform of two modulated signal is the convolution of the individual uh, sucked transforms with respect to the frequency variable. We can see that uh, modulation simply translates the, uh, the original defined sequence or the, the, the SAC domain representation uh, in, the, in the frequency domain. So from that perspective, uh, or now so far we have described uh, ODFS and radar, and we could nicely combine both of those ideas with using this uh, SAC representation. So how is, for example, uh, this used uh, in ODFS itself? For example, when you do channel estimation in ODFS, you want to identify what is the delay and the Doppler shift introduced by the reflectors in the channel because they cause your the inter simple interference. And what you want to do is, or what is done uh, or proposed is that you place a, a bilet symbol in here and you keep some guard band around this bilet because this allows you to directly observe how the symbol is delayed and Doppler shifted in this gap. And here you keep a guard band also before because uh, uh, there's a maximum delay. For example, all those symbols will also spread into this guard band and we don't want to get confused how this one is uh, spread. Uh, same here, because we have Doppler shifts and Doppler shifts can be either positive or negative. We also have to keep a guard band up and down. Uh, and then we directly can observe, for example, in this case, this symbol can only be spread in this. So by channel estimating, actually the ODFS uh, is probing the channel like a radar is doing, a pulse radar is doing. Um, the big difference is now in radar, you only define one non-zero uh, symbol here. And you want to directly observe how the symbol is spread. Whereas in ODFS, you define the whole grid to carry information and just keep one small part empty. And also a big difference between uh, ODFS and OFDM uh, uh, and pulse radar is that the choice of parameter. For example, when you talk about long range radar in automotive application, you talk about bandwidths of 250 megahertz, whereas in, in 802.11b or something like that, you talk about 10 megahertz. So the range resolution is very different. And that's why, for example, in ODFS, you only expect small shifts here and uh, you contain actually the spread of the symbols in a small region. Whereas in radars, actually you want to use this entire grid uh, to see the spread and to determine where some reflectors are because they give you the range and Doppler information. And to conclude my talk is, uh, I hope to yeah, give you a different point of view because I think this uh, SAC transform idea, it's very intuitive. It gives you a good understanding. 
And from that perspective, ODFS is nothing else than a pulse radar, which actually uses the whole delayed Doppler domain to define a signal. Whereas a radar can also be considered as an ODFS system, which defines only one symbol in the uh, delayed Doppler domain. And with that, I conclude my talk.